video now? Stream? Hit seven. <laughs> Hit seven? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to check. We got some pretty bad echo in here. I'm not sure why. Okay, we're live. Great. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second night of our webinar series at Aurora Recovery Center. Uh, my name is Ian Rabb, and I'm the Director of Business Development and Public Relations Officer at Aurora, as well as an addiction specialist. And um, we're really excited to be presenting this webinar uh, this week um, on many different topics uh, around, um, we did a uh, webinar last night on marijuana. Tonight, we're going to talk about alcohol addiction. Uh, tomorrow night is uh, we're going to talk about opioids and the opiate crisis and methamphetamine and then um, Thursday night mental health and on the final night uh, we're going to talk about interventions um, we're doing this for a number of reasons first of all to educate the public on these things but also uh, to get some information out to those that might be suffering from each of these addictions so we're hoping that uh, you're you're tuned in and um, are prepared for a lively discussion tonight around um, around alcohol. Tonight our um, presenter is named uh, Sandy, and Sandy is uh, has worked as a case manager for Mumaway, mental health worker for the Southern Health Authority, program coordinator for all the Alzheimer's Society, and has also been an adult mentor uh, for Nadinaway. Her specialty for the last seven years has been uh, mental health and addiction treatment. Um, and so we're really happy to have her with us. She's trained in applied counseling at Red River Community College with MVCI, ASSIST, Mental Health First Aid, and FASD. Sandy's skills also include group facilitation. In her spare time, Sandy works on her parents' farms, gardens, reeds, and keeps busy caring for her eight foster children at home. Um, all right, Sandy, welcome. Thank you. For Just relax and breathe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is your experience with alcohol addiction? Um, well, first of all, I'm in recovery myself. So I, for 11 years, I've been sober from alcohol. Um, so I guess some of my experience has been, well, what, most of it's been personal experience and in the problem and in recovery. Um, I also sponsor people that are in the AA program. So I work with alcoholics there. And then, of course, at Aurora Recovery Center as a 12-step addiction counselor. So tell us what you know about alcohol addiction. What I know about alcohol addiction is that it is a family disease and it affects everybody in the family, not only the um, person addicted, but um, the ones that live with them and, and their extended family and friends as well. All right, so you have a little bit of a presentation that you prepared for us? I do. And so let's, um, let's now go to that presentation and um, uh, please start um, writing some questions for us and, and uh, sending them in. And as soon as Sandy's done with her presentation, uh, we'll take questions and ans answer them um, from all of you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Ian. First of all, I wanted to um, give a definition uh, in the DSM-5, what the actual definition of, of alcoholism, and it's a chronic relapsing brain disease characterized by compulsive alcohol use, loss of control, um, and negative emotional state when not using. So that w is the actual definition of alcohol use disorder. Um, and I'll just talk about the symptoms as well. So one of the symptoms is that it's alcohol is often taken in larger amounts over a longer period than was intended. There's a persistent desire or unsuccessful effort to cut down or control alcohol use. A great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain alcohol, use alcohol, or recover from its effects. Craving or a strong desire to use alcohol. Um, the fifth symptom would be recurrent alcohol use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, school, and home. And continued alcohol use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused by or caused or exacerbated by the effects of alcohol. Seventh and important social, occupational or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of alcohol use. 
recurrent alcohol use in situations which it's physically hazardous. Alcohol use is continued despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or exasperated by alcohol. 10, tolerance is defined, tolerance as defined by other of the, of the following. A, a need for markedly increased amounts of alcohol to achieve intoxication or the desired effect, or B, a markedly diminished effect with continued use of the same amount of alcohol. And 11, withdrawal is manifested by either of the following. The characteristic withdrawal syndrome for alcohol and alcohol is taken to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. And when I first um, looked at whether or not I was an alcoholic, that was something that I discovered is that I could say yes to all of those questions. So that is definitely the sign of a severe alcoholic. All right. Yeah. Um, so the severity of alcohol use is measured by uh, those factors there. So if it's considered to be mild if at least two of those symptoms are present. It's moderate if there's four to five symptoms and severe if the presence of six or more symptoms. They can see it, so you have to just describe them. Um, one of the other things I'm often asked about is uh, what are the signs of alcohol withdrawal or what is alcohol withdrawal syndrome syndrome and luckily at Aurora we have a really good detox center so people that are patients or members at Aurora um, do get you know the best in in client care um, in our detox center but some of the things that people can experience uh, when you, a heavy drinker suddenly stops or significantly reduces their alcohol intake are things like a combination of physical and emotional symptoms from mild anxiety and fatigue to nausea. Some of the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal symptom are severe like hallucinations and seizures and at its most extreme it can be life-threatening so it's really important that when you're detoxing it's done in a medically safe environment. Next slide. Um, so the signs and symptoms of alcohol withdrawal symptom may appear anywhere from six hours to a few days after your last drink. And these usually include at least two of the following. So there could be tremors, anxiety, nausea, vomiting, headache, an increased heart rate, sweating, and irritability. Um, some other symptoms are confusion, insomnia, nightmares, and high blood pressure. And those symptoms may worsen over two or three days and persist for a few weeks. And they be, may be more noticeable when you wake up with less alcohol in your system. Um, the delirium tremens, is the DTs is what it's com commonly called by people, um, that includes things like extreme confusion, extreme agitation, a fever, seizures, and tactile hallucinations, like having that sense of itching or burning or numbness that isn't actually occurring. Auditory hallucinations are also possible, and uh, visual hallucinations are seeing images that don't exist. And what causes it? Excessive drinking. It excites and irritates the nervous system. If you drink daily, your body becomes dependent on alcohol over time. And when this happens, your central nervous system can no longer adapt easily to the lack of alcohol. So if you suddenly stop drinking or significantly reduce the amount of alcohol you drink, it can cause AWS, alcohol withdrawal symptom syndrome. And so the people who are at risk for it are people who are addicted to alcohol or drink heavily on a regular basis and cannot gradually cut down. And alcohol withdrawal syndrome is more common in adults, but children and teenagers who drink excessively may also experience those symptoms as well. You're also at risk if you've previously had withdrawal symptoms or needed medical detox for drinking. So one, one quick question for you. Yeah. There's a, there's a, we talked about the 11 symptoms of alcoholism. 
Now you're talking about alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Right. They're two different things. They absolutely are. Yeah. So if you're an alcoholic sitting watching us, mm -hmm. if you had some of the 11 symptoms but don't have the withdrawal, you can still be an alcoholic, right? You still could be, okay. absolutely. Thank and you. I'll clear that up even with a per with personally myself. I did not have a lot of those withdrawal sim symptoms when I, when I uh, stopped drinking. Um, I didn't have the DTs and things like that, but I, I was still an alcoholic. Yeah. All right. Um, medical treatment for um, alcohol withdrawal sy syndrome depends on how severe your symptoms are. So some people can actually be treated at home, but others may need the supervised care in a hospital setting to avoid you know, the potentially dangerous complications, such as seizures. And the first goal of treatment is to keep you comfortable by managing your symptoms. Alcohol counseling is another important treatment goal, and your doctor will want you to stop drinking as quickly and safely as possible. Most people with um, alcohol withdrawal syndrome, they fully recover. If you stop drinking, get treatment, and are otherwise healthy, the outlook is usually good. However, sleep disturbances, irritability, and fatigue may continue for months. Um, if um, alcohol withdrawal syndrome has advanced to the DTs, it can be fatal. If you begin experiencing severe symptoms, it's important to seek immediate medical attention. And the sooner you begin treatment, the better your chances are of avoiding life-threatening complications. Oh. Um, there's a question on the screen. Okay, so so the question is is where is where's a safe place to withdraw? Well, depending again on the severity of the withdrawal, a safe place to withdraw would be like at Aurora Recovery Center. We've got an excellent detox program there. There's um, detox programs available at hospitals you can check into. Health Science Center has one. Um, and at home if it's safe. So, so yeah, I was gonna say, and at home if it's safe. How do you provide safe. a safe environment at home if you don't know what's going on? Well, I would seek out medical attention, like the direction of a doctor before trying to detox someone on your own or detox yourself on your own. Um, if you know for sure you or your loved one has a heavy drinking problem or, or alcoholism, you just wanna make sure that it's so, so is detoxing just slowing down the amount you drink? Well, no, not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> you could try it that way, but I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Um, the safest way is to, um, and I did look up, there's a list of medications that are quite commonly given. Um, I don't know them offhand, but that's, doctors have the medical knowledge to detox you safely, and that's why I recommend people get that medical advice. So, so using medications is often, part yes. of the process of detox it is yes and will stop people necessarily from going into those dts or or seizures yeah it, their purpose is to stop them from going into seizure and into dts absolutely so if someone has aws mm -hmm. what about can, uh, if they decide just to stop drinking altogether is that a bad thing well that can be very dangerous it, it can be life-threatening in fact so it's better to do that under the medical advice of a doctor okay yeah how much were you drinking when you went through withdrawal? Myself? Sure. Um, well, when I quit drinking, I was drinking up to three to four forties of vodka a week. So it was a lot. I was, so, I was so, you were, you, you, so you would have some of the withdrawal symptoms then? I had the anxiety, the ir irritability. I didn't, I don't know how, but I really think it was uh, provided by my spirit, my higher power that protected me from the severity of the withdrawal, but That's yeah. good. Are we on to the next slide? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, prevention, how do you prevent alcohol withdrawal syndrome? The best way is to avoid regular heavy drinking. But if you're already dependent on alcohol, seek counseling and medical care, seek treatment. Um, the goal is to safely and gradually decrease your dependence on alcohol so that you can resume a healthy life. So is treatment always necessary? 
Well, I wouldn't say it's always necessary, but it sure gives you a good head start on the recovery process. Um, for myself, I didn't go to treatment right in recovery. I went to AA and it was great and I managed to stay sober. But three years into sobriety, I went to treatment um, because I wasn't doing well mentally. And I felt that that really just brought me right on track. So I think that you have a really good head start and um, if, you, if you go to Aurora. So drinking isn't really the problem. No. <laughs> no, I discovered that. Yeah, so that, yeah. I mean, we always say that in, when we talk about addictions, yeah. and any, any addiction to any substance, we spent a considerable amount of time last night talking about the fact that alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, isn't really the problem, but a symptom to a bigger problem. And I guess uh, your experience is that you're a perf perfect example of that, that uh, elimination of drink is just the beginning. It really was. Um, I had a mental health disorder that I hadn't taken care of up until I quit drinking. Um, that was a part of why I drank, I found out later. But again, that wasn't something that I discovered until I had actually stopped drinking and started the recovery process. All right. Yeah. <coughs> Another important piece with uh, the holidays coming up is how do you survive the holidays without drinking? especially when you're really used to that. So how do you do that? Well, um, most people know the holidays can be a period of emotional highs and lows. So there's loneliness, anxiety, happiness, and sadness. Those are all common feelings. The bad news is that the holiday blues can trigger relapse for people recovering from alcoholism and drug addiction. And the good news is, is that it can be remedied by planning ahead. So you're talking about planning ahead. So while we're on this subject, before we, we go into it, how do you plan ahead for um, preparing yourself to either not drink or be around drinkers? Well, I wasn't quite sure because I sobered up in November 11 years ago, so I, the, I knew the holidays were right around the corner. And typically over the years, my excuse to not quit yet was things like, oh, the holidays are coming or it's my birthday. But um, I just didn't expect my family to change anything. So when I was done drinking, I was done. And I was there wasn't and isn't anything that isn't is important enough to make me want to pick up again. The consequences would be too great. So I just let my family be. If they wanted to drink wine with dinner, go ahead. But I can tell you that um, in my experience is that sometimes people need to say to the family early in recovery, you know what, let's not have booze this year. Let's, let's try to do this without. And that's okay too. It's a personal choice for everyone. Okay. Why do the blues hit during the otherwise festive season? Um, there's a few reasons. Doing too much or too little and being separated from your loved ones, um, that can lead to sadness and depression. Many recovering people associate the holidays with memories of overindulgence or big benders or maybe relationship problems that happened or losses around the holiday season. People experience feeling, feelings of melancholy, sadness, and grief, and they tie it to their holiday recollections. Um, unlike clinical depression, which is more severe and can last for months or years, sometimes these feelings at Christmas time are just temporary. Anyone experiencing major symptoms of depression, though, such as persistent sadness, anxiety, guilt, changes in sleep patterns, etc., really should seek help from a mental health professional. Uncle Jack mm -hmm. comes to Christmas every year and is drunk as can be. And the family all kind of avoids him and some of the kids think he's funny and, you know, it, he's just that guy, right? What, are, what does the rest of the family do to deal with Uncle Jack? Well, it sounds like one of my uncles, actually. Oh. <laughs> but, um, you know, what the family can do is... <laughs> It's a disease. If he's an alcoholic, look at the person as someone with a with a disease of oh, addiction. Oh, it's just it's just Uncle Jack. Oh, That's what we expect from him every year. He comes and gets loaded. Yeah. Well, you know, and passes out in the same chair. <laughs> and sometimes that's just the way it is. Each family is different, but um, for me myself, like just being able to be there for that person when they need you and. I probably won't. So how can we come together as a family to help Uncle Jack? Well, it is a family disease. So um, a part of the uh, um, 
part of the the responsibility I think as a family member is to if you really want to understand Uncle Jack is to do something to help yourself um, personally I go to Al-Anon um, it's part of my recovery process I discovered and it's to help me with people in my family that have addictions so I'm Uncle Jack's nephew mm -hmm. and I want to go to Uncle Jack because I'm just sick of him being drunk and it always starts a fight. He gets mad and then he wants to leave and then we have to take his keys. It's a whole process. What do we do as family members that are just struggling with sitting by watching Uncle Jack do this every year? Well, you know, it really depends on the motivation of the family member and what their motives are. And is it to help Uncle Jack? And if you, your motive is to help Uncle Jack, help yourself first. Go to counseling, go to family programming, go to Al Anon. Look at what you can do. Look at what this disease of addiction does. Yeah. Maybe call and have an intervention for Uncle say, Jack. Would an intervention help? An intervention is an awesome idea, but get an interventionist to help you with that. It isn't advisable for families to just hold interventions on their own without support. Right. No. Um, when it comes to the holidays, um, you can develop a pretty good holiday plan. And one of the things I'd like to mention is that good self-care is really vital. So slow down, take some quiet time, meditate, and pray. Um, don't overindulge. This is for the alcoholic. This is for the alcoholic in recovery. In recovery. In recovery. Okay. So this is ways to kind of like help you get through that holiday season. Holiday season if you're in recovery. Um, don't overindulge. So balance your diet. Go easy on the sweets. Try to exercise regularly. Don't try to do too much. Get lots of sleep and maintain your schedule. All right. What What is the difference between um, alcoholism and drug addiction? Um, really not anything other than the drug of choice. Um, alcohol is a drug, um, so I look at it as the same. So last night we talked a little bit about, and I, I think it's prudent to, to speak of it again, mm -hmm. if alcohol is not the problem and the symptom, what is the problem? And yesterday we were talking about how, you know, feeling consciously separated or disconnected or not a part of or like your skin doesn't fit or you're around a square peg trying to fit in a round hole that those are really the signs of alcohol, the, the early signs of alcoholism or addiction. And, and ultimately, when you turn to alcohol, what happens? Alcohol changes your perception so that you feel comfortable, connected, and part of. And ultimately, if you're an alcoholic, you'll drink too much because you want more of that feeling. Exactly. And, and ultimately, you're left alone again. Yeah. So in saying that, most people, do you think they turn to alcohol first before drugs? Is alcohol like a premeditator too, because uh, it's legal and readily available? I would say um, probably, from my experience in raising teenagers, that marijuana is the first drug of choice that most people go to, especially if they have, a, you know, an addictive nature or a void to fill in their life. Um, and alcohol would probably be really close second to that. In, in from what I've read. All right. Yeah, and then it is also a gateway into harder drugs. Of course. Yeah. And so what what's uh, what are some steps to stay sober during the holidays? Um, put things in perspective. Like the holidays are important, but they're not everything. So there's no need to stress. And the first step to staying sober is to realize that age old phrase, this too shall pass. That's something we say in AA all the time. And that it's just another 24 hours. It's just another day, one day at a time. What's the difference between a craving and an obsession? Well, the obsession is the thought. That's what's in the mind and telling you. It's the lie telling you that you need to use. And the craving is when you actually take the first drink or use the drug and then it doesn't stop. That's the disease of more, I call it. So therefore, you're saying that the first drink is really the problem. The first drink is the problem because after that you have no... If you have the craving. If, you have the, if yeah. you have the craving. If the obsession is there, you aren't going to stop for anything. You're going to take that drink. How do... Um, how do I, this is a question that just came in, it says, how do I support my partner who's in recovery and what is my role? I've grown up with an alcohol, alcohol addiction in my family and I've been blessed with not having an alcoholic addiction myself. My question is, why do some people have the, in the family have the illness and some people don't? Well, first of all, um, if you have a partner in recovery, what's your role? It's a disease. 
that's the first thing to tell yourself. It is a disease. It's not a moral weakness. Um, there are support groups out there. So if supporting them may be um, to go to Al-Anon, go to family counseling and seek help for yourself first. Um, another part of it may be that your role is to, you know, have tough love and this is, you know, not the life you want to have and, and you need to express that to your partner so that they know. Okay. Then they have a choice. And then, and then the second question that, that I asked you mm -hmm. was, um, having grown up with alcoholism in the family, how does one pe person have it and another not? You know, I, that's a great question because I often wonder that. In my family, um, I have one sibling who is also an alcoholic, but uh, two that aren't, parents that aren't. And it's like, how did this happen? Yeah. Um, but it is, there is a genetic component. There is alcoholism that goes deep back in the family roots, <laughs> in my case, and in most. Uh, it's also a bit of environmental factors. Um, maybe people are raised in that environment, so it just seems like the natural way to live. We often hear that, um, that beyond the gene, that often um, there's a uh, there's a gene and there's usually some childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. What do you, can you tell me about trauma and its connection to alcoholism? Um, it, childhood trauma or trauma of any sort um, is sometimes what I think or what I've read too is it triggers that genetic component. So the ge genetic component may have been there all along. It may not have arisen if there was no uh, trauma in the person's past, but because of trauma, it was triggered. All right. Yeah. Do you have some more to share with us? Is there another slide? Mm -hmm. So another step to staying sober during the holidays is to have a plan. So prepare yourself for any situation and what you would do if it happened. So how to turn down a drink should also be in your arsenal. And one of the things that was in mind early in recovery, because I didn't want to say, I can't drink, I'm an alcoholic. Um, and I wasn't comfortable telling everyone that I was in recovery. So one of the things I would say is, well, I'm taking penicillin right now, so I can't drink alcohol. Um, or I'm on a cleanse right now, so. One of the things I find, because I'm also 16 and a half years clean yeah. and sober, obviously, um, <clears throat> I find you go to a party and everybody asks you, where's your drink? Yes. Yeah. So what I've done over the last number of years is I bring ginger ale and I put it in a beer glass. Oh, yeah. And, that's a good idea. and uh, no one asks me if yeah. I want a drink yeah. or just tomato juice. Yeah. So that's one of the other things. If you're struggling and you want to be somewhere and you don't want people to ask you all the time, exactly. they have a drink in your hand. But of course, I drink ginger ale alcoholically. Yeah. So I need lots of ginger yeah, ale. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, and another part of your plan, if especially early in recovery, is uh, to have an escape plan. So if you're at a, um, a, a sorry, if you're at an outing where there is drinking, you can always have an escape plan. Like, oh my, my daughter called. I have to go. Um, so pre-plan an escape pre -plan plan. Pre-plan it. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Awesome. Um, another step is to put your sobriety first, put your recovery first. So it's not selfish to do that. It's necessary because if you're not in recovery, you can't be the best version of yourself. Okay. If and you're not in recovery, you're in relapse. Yeah. So I think we should also talk a little bit about the alcoholic that's still using. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and, and ultimately I talked a little bit about Uncle Jack, mm -hmm. but what are some other scenarios? Um, that people could be faced with over the holiday season with an alcoholic in their home? Um, well, you can probably look at there'd be disruptions in schedule because um, maybe they're, they've slept in or, or have left to go drink and haven't come back yet and you need to go to Aunt Irma's for dinner. So those are some of the things that I know I caused. <laughs> so if I, if I show up to Aunt Irma's two hours late, yeah. Would, would, if you're the family member, do you start a fight with me because I'm two hours late? Um, a lot of family members do, yeah, absolutely, because it's, that, just, is, it's is that, disrespectful. Right, so is that the right thing to do? How do we get through the Christmas season dealing with an alcoholic? Getting through it, dealing with an alcoholic can be difficult. It takes a lot of patience, it takes tolerance and kindness, and it really takes a big understanding of the alcoholic mind and where their disease has led them. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with them? It's really going to be a personal choice on how you do. Um, but fighting with, but them, if, fighting with them is not going to get them to fighting quit. Fighting with them is not going to make them quit. Uh, arguing with them, isn't, begging them isn't going to make them quit. 
The only thing is if they concede to their innermost selves that they're alcoholic, that's going to make them quit. All right. Just a quick reminder, uh, as we're going to start taking questions from Sandy, please submit your questions online. You can uh, email them to us and we'll get to them, uh, get to them shortly. What is the um, success rate using the, the 12 steps as opposed to not going to the 12 step program? Is there a, is there, do you have an answer to that? Well, there's, you know, I've, I've looked at different statistics that in the AA Big Book, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I believe it says about 50% recover going in, another 25% relapse but come back, and then another 25% that come in don't come back at all. Um, now, <coughs> also, what I've heard is that if you're following the program of recovery, the success rate is 100%. So if you're doing the steps and doing the recovery work, you won't are there Are there other ways besides the 12 steps to just remain clean and sober? Absolutely. Um, that's the way that I worked it, and it's worked out for me, but there are, I'm not as familiar with the other ways, but um, I know people can do it on a religious basis. And um, uh, Is Alcoholics Anonymous religious? No, it's not religious at all. It's a spiritual program. Okay, good. Yeah. Do you have another slide? Um, be ready. Uh, another thing to stay sober during the holidays is to be ready to address your sobriety. So if you're attending holiday parties with friends and family, chances are you might be offered a drink or asked why you weren't drinking. Yeah, we so talked about that. You are prepared. Yeah. You know. That's one of the most annoying things. It really is. Do you is. want a drink? Do you want a drink? Do you want yeah. a drink? Do you oh, want just, a drink? Have yeah, just have one. <laughs> you don't want to know the answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, another way to stay sober is to embrace the gratitude. So having a gratitude list, writing it out, thinking about what you're grateful for during the holiday seasons keeps you in a positive frame of mind. Um, another thing you can do is uh, help other people in your 12-step program, volunteer. Just gets you out of yourself and thinking about other people. Okay. And then, and then what, did you, you had another idea where you said um, holidays aren't a good excuse to drink. Often people think, like you said, yeah. I'm not going to quit now. There's the holidays. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so then what, what are other suggestions? Well, if you're, if, do you mean like if, um, okay, remember the holidays aren't a good excuse to drink, but they are a great excuse to spend time with your family and friends and spread holiday cheer. So keep sobriety as a priority and it will always be safe awesome Do we have another question how is it helpful to me to help others well it takes you out of your own mind so if you're helping other people you can't be like for myself when I help others it seems to me that um, God puts people in my path to help so that it takes me out of my own mind so alcoholics and drug addicts have a tendency to have a lot of um, self-pity, uh, self, self, self-indulgence and uh, selfishness. So actively trying to help other people takes us out of that space of uh, poor me. One thing that I, I heard about recently is at that Aurora Recovery Center, we started the ARC Squad. Yes. And the ARC Squad really spends its time doing things for other people. And uh, it's alcohol is helping other people. So what are some of the things that Arc Squad has done and some things that they could do together to help other people during the season? Well, the Arc Squad has been busy doing different things like uh, they made um, bags to donate uh, items that were needed for Main Street Project. They had a fun run in the fall to help raise money for um, one of our sober living facilities. And um, there also is alumni, people that have left Aurora Recovery Center, and we're now going to start buddying up with people who are actually just leaving Aurora Recovery Center so that they can help each other. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, what is advised after residential treatment? Um, it's different for everybody. Some people, uh, it's really advisable for them to go to a sober living facility. Um, they appreciate the structure. Maybe they need the um, direction to go to meetings on a regular basis. And it's a safe, sober place to live. 
So is it really important to stay connected to the treatment center or the recovery center that you go to? I believe so, yeah. Um, the reason I think it is is because it just gives you a sense of belonging. As addicts and alcoholics, we um, we crave to belong to something, so to I, someone. Yeah. To, and um, after we've lost our best friend of alcohol or drugs, you know, we still need that sense of belonging. So, uh, so, so after uh, recovery, continuing care probably is a really important aspect of recovering your life. Right, it is. And at Aurora Recovery Center, we have a continuing care program, and it is for life, and I actually happen to host it now. So on Wednesday evenings, we have our continuing care. And that's great. And yeah, you have it's great, great to connect with everyone. And you have good participation? We really do. That's, all, yeah, that's really absolutely. awesome. How do you help someone who uses alcohol to cope with social anxiety? Or someone who refuses to take medications for anxiety or depression and his or, and his or her only friends drink alcohol excessively. So this, this person binges for, you know, four or five days at a time and then he thinks he or she can quit on his own, however, has no other hobbies at all. Right, yeah. Um, first of all, helping someone cope with social, who has social anxiety disorder, um, <coughs> me. that's someone that would probably need to look at counseling and <coughs> just some behavior therapy on how to go into situations and learn over a period of time <coughs> how to do that and uh, their coping skills. <coughs> Um, someone that refuses to take their medication for their anxiety or their mental health disorder is actually quite common and um, I, I've been guilty of it myself <clears throat> and is something to just gently remind people like this is good for you. Well people, sub if they're not taking their medication, will they so often substitute alcohol for medication? Um, they I absolutely could. I can't sleep unless I have a couple absolutely. shots before bed. Yeah, absolutely. And, and people do use alcohol and drugs to help them sleep and to cope and for their anxiety and their depression. Yeah. All right. Um, if someone's binging for four or five days at a time, and I've run across this with different people I sponsor. Um, binging is still excessive drinking, and it's still excessive, and it's still alcoholism. If you, it, all it is is if you take that one drink and you can't stop. If you use that one time and you can't stop. So I have 10 of the 11 symptoms, mm -hmm. but I only drink Saturday nights with my friends, mm -hmm. and I get really drunk on Saturday night, and... Um, um, can I be? Um, can I be still considered an alcoholic? Absolutely, you could still be considered an alcoholic. Why is that? Well, because it's not about the amount, how many days in a week you drink. It's what happens when you do drink. What are the consequences? And if your consequence, if you don't know what the consequences are going to be after you take one drink, then you probably have a problem with alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you another question, or similar. Um, so an alcoholic can be someone who drinks once, and an alcoholic can be someone that drinks once a week and someone that drinks every day. Absolutely. Now, what a, what's a blackout? A blackout? I want to just tell you something. Yeah. When I got to recovery, yeah. um, I didn't get here. I started with alcohol in my early years um, and, and went back to alcohol in my late years, but I, 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 they, they were talking about blackouts, and I didn't even know what that was mm. in recovery. I'm like, I blacked out. I'm like, blacked out? I was awake all the time. So what is a what is a blackout and, and what does that look like? And you know, people think blackouts are when people pass out. Blackouts are when people are awake mm -hmm. and don't know what they're doing. Absolutely, yeah. And I did experience blackouts myself and there's two kinds of blackouts. There's the kind where you can, um, the next day people mention a few things and you can vaguely re recollect what happened the night before but not completely um, and then the other more severe type of blackout sorry I don't know the medical name is where you can actually black out and not remember long periods of time which could even be days or weeks um, and it's been um, you know people can mention to you do you remember doing this and you have no recollection so the severity of the blackout really depends on your um, alcoholism and how far it's gone all right so once again we're getting close to the end we have about 20 minutes left and um, i just want to remind you to please submit your questions um, to us um, as we're sitting here and we'll we'll continue 
Recommendations on how a spouse, uh, here's a question, recommendations on how a spouse who has left the relationship to, con to cope with the guilt of leaving the alcoholic know there will be a relapse. Well, knowing there will be a relapse. Right. Um, and you know, when people run into this all the time, unfortunately, if you have a loved one that's in the problem and you, for your own sanity and your own um, safety, a lot of times you need to leave. Um, it is hard knowing that that, because you still love the person, but you can't live with the behavior of the disease. Um, get support, you know, make sure you have a support system in place before you leave even, and um, utilize it. How, how, uh, how often do people relapse? Um, Leaving, especially, or, or what is the percentage of relapse coming out of treatment? Is when people go to a recovery center, um, obviously if they don't follow their recovery plan or they don't uh, uh, look at their relapse plan or their triggers for relapse, um, there's a good chance of relapse. Do we know what the percentages of people are that relapse? Um, you know, it, I've read different statistics, but I think the most reliable one I read was about 50% will relapse. I've read that up to 90% relapse, but that's people without a recovery plan. At Aurora, we, have, we equip people with getting the steps started already and um, with um, you know a, a really solid recovery plan before they leave. So. And are there usually co-occurring mental health issues um, when you're dealing with an alcoholic? Yeah, <laughs> most of the time. Um, oh, it's actually about 40, it's 40% 40 of the time. Um, if, you, if you have alcoholism, you'll also have a mental health disorder and vice versa. We have a question from someone that said, I'm getting addiction support in online groups. Is that enough? Well, it certainly can be. Um, the only drawback to that would be the fellowship component. I think it's really important to make friends in recovery so that you have a bigger support system. But if you're not mobile or unable to um, attend groups, then online is definitely a good option. Okay. Um, are there groups all the time? Like over Christmas, um, will there be... 12 step meetings, the regular times, yes. uh, everywhere in the city? Absolutely, we have over 40 groups, AA groups in, in Winnipeg and um, they all keep business as usual. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the bigger groups will have um, extended hours so that their club room is open for the whole day. So that newly recovered person that's having trouble at their Christmas party, yeah. their family party can say, hey, I gotta go to meet my support group for Absolutely. a while. Absolutely, and they that's can actually great. find an AA group that's open pretty much all day, every day, at, at certain, at, during this holiday time of year. That's great. Yeah. I'm just waiting for a few more questions. How do I cope with the shame that comes um, comes after a public alcohol display. Like I, if I'm out in public and um, um, I act completely crazy, is there shame associated with that or do, do you just drink more? <laughs> well, there is a lot of shame and I call it toxic shame because um, after a particularly um, bad bender, people will go into, well, what did I do? People have called them out on it and they know what they've done. So one of two things, you can either shut down, not admit it and lie about it, or um, you can face it and uh, realize that those are the consequences. I, I, I can imagine that um, someone that knows they want to, knows they have an alcohol problem, that they've proven it over and over, mm -hmm. and uh, they want to quit, but they can't quit. Mm -hmm. The severe shame and depression that comes with that. Absolutely. So I feel like a failure, not realizing that it's a brain disease, you know, and, and it's something that it isn't a reflection of you as a person. You know, it's, it's part of the disease. So talk a little bit more about the disease. We talked about it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, Talk a little bit more about what you know about the disease of addiction and well, al alcohol, addiction to alcohol. Well, it's a disease of the mind and body, and the disease of the mind part is the um, the obsession that you get in your mind, the lies that you tell yourself, or the the delusions that you have. Um, it's like a, tr a master trickster that's telling you it's okay to drink when you. 
and you don't think about the consequences of it. So that's is every, a big part of it. Is everybody else wrong? Everybody else is wrong when you're in the problem. When yeah. you're an alcoholic? And they're all attacking you. And you blame, you blame everything on everyone else. And the alcoholic does blame everything on everyone else. It's very sad. Yeah, it it's is. A very, it's very a sad, sad, lonely way to live. They are, they've often called um, alcoholism the loneliness disease. It is. Um, I, I know that, that for me, and one of the reasons that I, I've been able to stay clean and sober the number of years that I have is that, that I had a sponsor that told me mm -hmm. from the beginning that it's, a, it's called the loneliness disease. You feel, you feel consciously separate, separated and disconnected. And if I hadn't been told that that was the definition of alcoholism, or he would say constant thought of self, how do I look? How do I feel? What do people think? What do people say? So talk to me now a little bit about the mind of the alcoholic. Yeah, that's a really good point, is um, that self-involvement. So it's to protect the addiction, mostly, and it actually is cultivated because of the addiction. But even in early in recovery, it continues on, or later in recovery, it can continue on too. But it's that self-centeredness that we as addicts have um, to protect our addiction. Is it curable, alcoholism? It's not curable, but it can be arrested. And it's a day-by-day -day program. So one day at a time, you know, it was a lot for me to think, oh my God, I can never drink again. Especially when I was drinking, uh, you know, three, four times a week, a lot. And all of my friends drank a lot. And that was my whole life. Um, so to go from that to I can never drink again when I was only 36, huge, huge barriers for me. But once it was explained to me, it's only one day at a time. You can always drink tomorrow. Uh, well, I could wrap my head around that. Yeah, just go to sleep sober. Just go to sleep sober. Wake and up, and then, and then you wake up sober, and then you and just have to go to sleep ball. sober. Yeah. And not worry about long term. Not worry about it at all. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree. Is it possible to convince someone that they are an alcoholic, they, uh, they're an alcohol addict? Well, people tried to convince me, and it didn't work. That's all I really know about it. And um, anybody who I've worked with, um, if they struggle with that label, um, it's, it's really beneficial for me to just say, well, look at what the signs and symptoms are of an alcoholic. Um, can you control your drinking? Um, well, maybe go try some controlled drinking for a while and see how it works for you. Like just see have two can. and stop? Just have two and stop. And not think about more. Go home and don't think about it. If you can do that, you're probably not an alcoholic. If you can't, you probably are. All right. I, um, I, I read some stuff of, uh, from the early 1930s and 40s, Carl Jung, mm -hmm. famous psychologist. Mm -hmm. And he often said that the thirst of an alcoholic is a thirst for wholeness. Mm -hmm. And that somehow the spirit of the alcoholic got separated from the spirit or from love or from life or from family or from good or from God or from whatever you want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Is that common? Uh, is that the truth in uh, and common with all of the people that you work with? It's absolutely true and very common with the people I work with. Um, true for myself, I remember at 16 years old denouncing my faith uh, because I wanted to drink and I wanted. I felt like I belonged to those people that that did that. It wasn't until you know I quit that I came back to my faith. You know where, where do where a question just came in said where do I begin with helping a family member? I mean, it's so hard. I always say that um, alcoholism is like B.O. The alcoholic's always the last to know they stink. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so where do we begin when you have a family member that's in such denial? What's the begin? You know, where, where does it start? And, and then talk a little bit about how alcoholism affects the family. Um, well, the family rolls around the alcoholic. Okay. Well, one of the things that um, you can start with is... Uh, Go to Al-Anon and let them know you're going to get help because it's hurting you, um, the alcoholic behavior. Uh, quite often people that live with an alcoholic or addict start acting the same way. They go through the same types of symptoms and they, they start obsessing about the alcoholic. What's he doing? Is he drinking? Is he using? What's going on? So that's one part of it. Um, having a frank conversation, there's nothing wrong with that. Just because the alcoholic doesn't want to talk about it doesn't mean that you can't talk about it. So sitting down and saying, I believe you have a problem with alcohol, this is why. There's a question here, it says, um, does, do alcoholics lie? <laughs> 
Yes. Because my husband lies about everything. Yes, they lie and they do that to protect their addiction. Um, they don't do it because they're bad people. They don't do it because um, they want to get away with something, although that could be a part of the, the manipulation and control. But alcoholics are master manipulators and they'll lie, cheat, steal, do whatever they have to do to get their drug. Is it, do they only treat, do they only cheat and steal and lie to get their alcohol? Or? No, I think they become like really addicted to the whole chaotic way of life, the drama. Yeah. So they're very manipulative. Very manipulative, um, yeah. Someone just wrote in and said, never drinking again sounds impossible to me right now. Again, I would say like, look at it as today. Just look at today. Don't look at, you know, the never again. It's one day at a time. And, um, and, and we, we promote that at Aurora Recovery Center. Absolutely, we? yeah. And that's um, a good point. At Aurora, at our treatment center at Aurora, and at our AA groups, it's one day at a time. You don't have to think about, you know, the next 10 years, 20 years, but, whatever but the case may be. The same person said, but, but I'm getting married in the ne next summer. If I quit drinking now, how am I going to have a glass of wine at my wedding? Well, again, one day at a time, get up to the wedding, see how much better your life has become with uh, sobriety and recovery, and I bet you you won't want that drink at your wedding. Yeah, I always say just do 90 days sober, and if you're not happy, we'll give you your misery. Yeah. You're going to have all of your misery back your right misery at, the end, back. Back at yeah. the end. I love that. Just again, we have about 10 minutes left, and um, we're getting lots of good questions from the viewers, and I would appreciate if you would send in a few more because we're getting close to the end. Any more questions, please? Do you have anything else you want to share with us, um, Sandy? Um, no, I think that was everything I had prepared, but um, I'm just glad we talked about, you know, the holiday season. You know, getting through that is, is really vital for a lot of people in recovery. Now, if you're in the problem of alcoholism and you're thinking, you know, I'm going to wait to the new year to address this, that's pretty common. Um, just remember there is lots of help available out there and it doesn't hurt to start looking at some of those solutions before the holidays. Prepare yourself. All right. Any more questions? We, uh, we also at Aurora Recovery Center have our, our counseling. Our counseling is an outpatient clinic um, on Skirfield Road. Um, and there's, uh, we're, we're available for one-on-one -on -one counseling and some significant programs also that are not inpatient program, in, 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 in member programs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in member <laughs> programs. Um, at Aurora Recover, we're very member, member centric. So we, we, uh, we have very, we build independent treatment plans for clients. Do you want to talk about a little bit, um, about independent treatment plans for someone struggling with alcohol addiction? Absolutely. You know, at Aurora, we've got, um, you know, kind of a mainstream program, but there's people that don't, you know, they don't quite fit it, maybe because of a mental health disorder, or maybe they've tried different things in the past, it doesn't work for them. So we do look at to individualized treatment plans for people. It may be that they get more one-on-one -on -one counseling rather than group time. You know, it just depends. So my, my, another question just came in. My spouse decided to um, stop drinking hard liquor and now they're just drinking wine and they think that's better. Is there a difference? Oh, uh, no, there's not a difference. Um, I switched to beer to wine to hard liquor and back to beer. It doesn't really make a difference because uh, it's once you start drinking, it's whether or not you can actually control. So, it so if they're having a whole glass of a whole bottle of wine, mm -hmm. there might be a problem. There would be, yeah, I would say. We always. Is it true that a glass of wine a day is healthy? Um, yeah, I've heard that. If you can manage to have only one glass of wine, I've heard that it helps the heart. So, I just never could. Do one glass. So alcoholics can't have one glass of wine? No, no, they can't. They can't drink again. Abstinence is the best plan of recovery. Uh, and talk a little bit about abstinence. Um, well, abstinence means like completely not having any alcohol ever or drugs or whatever the case may be. Oh, here's another question. I sometimes bake with alcohol. If, oh. I, have a, if I have an alcoholic husband, is it okay to bake with alcohol? 
Oh, that's a good question. I stayed away from using uh, alcohol in my cooking just because I really wanted to be 100% abstinent, but um, alcohol cooks off, so there isn't actually any alcohol in the product after you cook it. Someone just said my, my, uh, I, that he wants to go abstinent, he wants to quit drinking, but his partner doesn't want to do it with, with him. How can he convince her? Or can um, he? You, you probably really can't. Like, it, I think that if abstinence, if you want to have an at, um, complete abstinence from alcohol or for yourself, that's one thing. But you can't really force that on someone else. It is a personal choice. So you just have to look at whether or not, um, you know, maybe their alcohol isn't a problem. So you got to accept the fact that that's the way it is. Yeah. So... Our message to you tonight is really to get help before it's too late. And we're available uh, We're available at Aurora Recovery Center. We're doing these webinars um, every night this week to basic, basically inform the public as well as uh, share with those people in recovery and out of recovery um, uh, some struggles they might have during the holidays. Tomorrow's topic is mental health. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be talking mental health and addictions. And... Um, we're going to cover that in depth. We know now that co-occurring disorders around those people addicted to drugs and alcohol are on the are rampant, and uh, and ultimately we got to look at each person individually to see what came first, the chicken or the egg, the addiction or the mental health issue. Please um, get online and uh, share with those those others other share with other people our email address, our web our our web address. Sorry, so that you can. Um, Register for tomorrow's topic. Thursday, uh, we'll be talking about opiates and uh, methamphetamine abuse, which are really important. You can register for both of those seminars tomorrow and Thursday at AuroraRecoveryCenter.com. And then on Friday, we're going to talk about interventions, both um, interventions that you uh, are done like the TV show intervention with an interventionist, interventionist in the room and those times when families can intervene and have a successful intervention without an outsider. Again, you can register at aurorarecoverycenter.com and we look forward to your participation in the next three nights. Okay. We're four minutes early. <laughs> <laughs>